This is a library that I've been working on for a while. Um, and uh, <coughs> of course, in the, uh, especially in the Erlang community, uh, it seems like locking is the one thing that everyone wants to avoid. Now, for those of you who are listening to Hans's presentation, he actually did mention um, why you want to have locking and also why you want to have a locking system that uh, both scales but is, uh, allows you to control locality so you don't, have to, you don't have to lock everything. Now, locking itself is just a convenient pattern, obviously. Erlang is an, an orchestration language, a coordination language. Locking is a coordination pattern. Uh, Erlang should have a good locking library. Um, and um, one of the things that I've been um, thinking is that if you're building really big systems, for example, using uh, React Core or React, I know in React 2.0, for example, they are adding uh, strict consistency so that once you've written an object, written a value and you've read it back, you're guaranteed that you're actually going to get the same value back until you change it next time, which with read to repair, for example, you, you're not guaranteed. Um, this would allow you to be able to run localized transactions on top of React and actually get transaction consistency on top of that, um, assuming that you have a library that scales pretty well. Now, uh, the problems with distributed locking is partly scalability, uh, but also with locking in general, uh, obviously uh, you have a complexity problem. Uh, for example, forgetting to unlock uh, resources that you've claimed and things like that. With, in a, the distributed case, um, and in concurrent systems, I mean, the biggest problem is deadlock. Uh, and there are various uh, approaches to scaling that. Now, if you want to make um, another problem, obviously, with distribution is net splits. So if you have a, a, a resource that you're locking and you get a split network, you can actually have two people who have claimed the same lock. And then if the network heals, you have a conflict that you have to resolve. And in the general case, if you want to build a complete uh, locking library, you, you need to be able to have, or at least you usually want to have, read and write locks, uh, where write locks obviously are exclusive locks, only one at a time can have them. Read locks are non-exclusive, so several people can uh, claim the same object at the same time. You also want to have hierarchical locks. For the classical hierarchical lock in a database is that you either have table locks or object locks, for example. In, um, in Fora Labs, where we do um, device management, we like to work with uh, tree structured databases. And there, you want to generalize the hierarchy so that it's actually, you want to be able to go down into a tree and lock just a particular subtree. So, <coughs> very simple dependency, or this is more an introduction to the notation because I don't think I have to uh, uh, explain dependency graphs. So, I just use an arrow. Uh, an arrow from A to B uh, means that A waits for B, and uh, over there you have a deadlock. A waits for B, B waits for A. You can also have an indirect deadlock. So, in the distributed case, the different approaches um, that you may see is that you maintain a central dependency graph. Actually, you may not see that in many cases because it's a really bad solution, obviously. You get a bottleneck and also you get a single point of failure. And um, also, if you, if you want to maintain a global dependency graph, that is very expensive. You can use deadlock prevention. In the Mnesia uh, database, for example, I guess that's the most famous uh, Erlang exponent of uh, deadlock prevention. 
The trick then is that dependencies can only go in one direction. You simply do not allow uh, dependencies to go, say, from bigger transactions to uh, smaller transactions. And if you get one such dependency, you restart uh, a transaction. This is cheap. Um, it's very easy to check. You don't have to maintain a dependency graph. You just have to compare um, the PIDs in a, in a dependency that you find. Of course, the problem is that you can, uh, you can have phantom deadlocks. You will restart transactions that actually were not part of a deadlock. They just um, could potentially lead to a deadlock. And we've seen in some cases uh, that are exercising Nisia reasonably hard that you can have, say, a 10 to 20% overhead just from restarting transactions <coughs> without actually having deadlocks. Um, and also, if you run very large transactions, uh, the chances uh, increase and you have a lot of concurrency. So in some cases, you can actually have a lot of transaction restarts. Another problem is that since transactions are restarted uh, as a preemptive measure, you cannot use side effects except the approved side effects. So in most cases, you can design your application so that you will not have deadlocks. But if you're using, for example, Nisia, that is not a sufficient uh, guarantee that you will not have transaction restarts. So you cannot use side effects anyway. I wanted to use side effects uh, in my database transactions. But I was willing to pay the price that if I have a <coughs> deadlock, then I will abort that. Uh, or the transaction involved. Another uh, technique is probes, uh, where the transactions actually share dependency info with each other, or the, uh, the database agents, or however it is implemented. And uh, my algorithm is essentially a probe-based uh, algorithm, but it's mm, not exactly like the ones documented in literature. The algorithm itself, I actually designed that back in 93 when I started using Erlang. Um, the reason why I used, started using Erlang was that I wanted to build a distributed messaging system and uh, also a, I needed a distributed database. Uh, back in 93, we didn't even have Nisia, we didn't have ETS, so I had to start from the ground uh, up. Uh, Needless to say, I didn't finish. Um, but I did design a deadlock detection algorithm. And it ended up being um, reasonably unique because uh, I was cooped up in a basement in Alaska and I didn't have um, access to uh, much literature at the time. So I essentially just sat down and thought really hard for about three days and came up with something that I thought should work. Later on, I actually, I was talking to Thomas Arts, and uh, I, part of it was that uh, at Ericsson, we were asked to apply for patents. And um, I took the opportunity to talk to him and say, well, uh, before we go further with this, could we actually see if it works? So he ended up, he thought it was a cool uh, little project, and he ended up model checking it. And after a few tweaks, he was able to verify uh, after model checking that um, it, it was not only robust but also minimal, which is a good property. Um, so I guess that was mainly um, a fluke, I would say. But after that, uh, I, I picked it up again and I added the things that I think a lock manager should have, for example, read-write locks and hierarchical locks and also multi-node locks. None of these things were part of the model checking, but obviously none of these will actually break <coughs> the algorithm because when you add stuff after model checking, that never breaks anything. I also um, added a gen leader type behavior that I will talk a little bit about. So <clears throat> the implementation is uh, quite Erlangy. 
um, in order to maximize latency, you have the user process spawns a locking agent. This process will do the dependency analysis. It talks to a lock server. Every node has its own lock server. And uh, the agents can also request locks on other nodes. And um, actually, one of the things I haven't implemented, which might be a bit unusual for a, for a locking library, is unlock. There is no unlock feature. Um, what you do is you end the transaction. Uh, this is, I think, if imagine or think, uh, say, Mnesia transactions. You will accumulate locks until you commit, and then you release uh, your locks at the end of the transaction. So essentially, you just kill the, the locks agent, and the lock server will note that and, uh, and release all locks. It's quite convenient. I think you, well, it wouldn't be that hard to implement unlock. I just haven't found a use for it yet. So, <clears throat> I think it's uh, sort of a Erlangy. The lock itself is a process. Actually, I have one lock, one server implementing um, all lock processes. But essentially, the agent talks to the lock process and it talks back. Um, and it's all asynchronous <coughs> message passing and, um, and all dependency analysis is distributed. Essentially, you could think of distributed analysis or dependency analysis in the literature is you have one database manager here, you have one database manager here. Each of them has its own dependency analysis and sometimes they talk to each other. Um, in this case, every transaction is its own dependency manager. So, I have uh, written some graphs to um, illustrate how it could look. Here we have two clients, <coughs> client C1 and C2, and I have one lock in this case. And this is um, a simple case. The client one uh, locks L1, and it gets a message back, and the way the lock manager response is that it sends you the lock and essentially the queue. And in this case, the queue is one client, so I have the lock because I'm at the head of the queue. Um, now client two tries to lock the same object and it gets, now the lock manager sends a message to each client here with an updated queue. So C2 is waiting for C1. Now, here we pretend that there is an unlock, and if client one unlocks, uh, then C2 will get an updated message with a new queue, and it knows that it has the lock. So in this case, we have two clients, one lock, three lock operations, resulting in seven messages. So essentially, it's... Uh, one message pair per lock operation plus an additional message there for the dependency since one client is waiting for another. We make it a little bit more di difficult. This is actually a deadlock situation. Um, I can point to this one for a while. Client C1 locks L1. C2 tries or locks L2. And C1 tries to lock uh, L2 and is put in the queue. And C2 tries to lock L1. Now, in this case, this is a trivial deadlock case because both clients have enough information to detect a deadlock. Uh, so essentially, it just maintains a dependency graph, and in this case it finds a cycle. C1 waits for C2, which waits for C1. And in this case, um, the rule is the biggest client can surrender this lock. So it sends a, a surrender message to uh, 
for log two, and then the information is updated, and now uh, C1 has both logs. And in this case, actually, the lock manager took C2 and put in, put the, put, put it at the end of the queue. So in this case, we had two clients, two locks, four lock operations, two dependencies where C1 was waiting for C2 and C2 was waiting for C1, and one deadlock resolution operation. And that resulted in 13 messages. Okay, a little bit more difficult then. Three clients, three locks. Client one locks uh, L1, client two locks L2, client three locks L3. Client one tries to lock L2 but is put in the queue. Client two tries to lock um, L3, a little typo there, is put in the queue. And client three is trying to lock L1. So now there is a deadlock, but none of the clients have enough information to resolve or to de detect the deadlock. So now we get to the um, um, additional feature that is needed, and this is where probes come in. The uh, the agents need to share information with each other. And um, there are some uh, examples in the literature. There is the Chandi Misra Haas detection algorithm from 83, where, where an agent or a transaction is waiting for a lock, it sends a probe message to the lock owners that it is waiting for, and to the other lock owners. Owners and they, when they receive a probe message, they will send that message to all lock holders that it is waiting for, and so on. And eventually, if it comes around in a loop, then you have a deadlock. In the Silberschatz Galvin detection algorithm from '93, essentially, you imagine that you have one dependency graph per node, and then you put in a little proxy or external indicator here saying in this particular dependency, P3, for example, is on this node, so then I have to send this information, the one that it doesn't know about, to this node. Um, and then hopefully it will know enough to detect the information. So what we're saying is we send information to clients lock holders where their PID is greater than ours and they are not involved in that particular lock because if, if they were in the queue, they would already know about it. So we find for each lock holder that is greater than us, if they are not in the queue, we send that lock information to them. And <clears throat> this will, and this is what uh, Thomas Arts showed, uh, eventually one agent will have sufficient information to detect the deadlock. So, in this case, we actually, um, let me go back, we were um, here, I, restarting from here. L2 or C1 tries to lock L2 and uh, C2 tried to lock L3, same typo. In this case, client 2 sends information to client 3 about lock 2, which, is, which it is not involved in. And uh, when L1 tries to lock or C3 tries to lock L1, Actually, client one will also uh, send an Im a message to client two. So ideally here, we might be able to get away with 
sending just one, because in this case, actually only one of them, but I think there are some corner cases where you actually have to send both to be sure that deadlock is detected. So in this case, once this message, you get that complementary message and, or, and this lock message, then C3 will have enough information to detect the deadlock. And in this case, C3 will surrender. C2 will also detect the deadlock, but it, it will know that C3 is uh, the greater agent, so it will just lock or wait for C3. In this case, we had three clients, three locks, six lock operations, three direct dependencies, and then we also added two indirect dependencies, two information messages, and then one deadlock resolution uh, operation, which means six message pairs uh, for the operations, adding three uh, direct dependency messages, two indirect dependency uh, messages, and then three messages for the, uh, the uh, surrender, and then they have 20 messages in all. Now, <clears throat> surrendering is really cool. Um, I worked hard on that feature. Uh, but it is not always useful. Now, if you have a database transaction where you're reading, the, you're locking objects, you're reading data, and based on the data you've read, you claim other locks, then you cannot have the transaction surrender a lock that you've already operated on and claimed other locks based on. So in that case, uh, what you want to do is most likely abort instead. You have, a true, you have a true deadlock. It's not a phantom deadlock. It's a true deadlock. But if, if you're halfway through a database transaction, all you can do then is abort. So the idea here is you have an option, say, abort on deadlock. And you can still do a surrender but it depends on whether the client has asked for confirmation that it has the locks, has the lock. So if you've actually informed the client that the lock is held, you cannot surrender it. Then you will abort instead. But otherwise, it's perfectly okay to abort, to surrender. And this becomes interesting when you have multi-node locks. This was not part of the model checking, um, but the idea here is that you take the lock resource and pair it with the node identity, that becomes your lock instance. So if you want to claim a lock on multiple nodes, the dependency algorithm treats every lock instance as a separate lock. And um, in that case, you don't really have to worry about the dependency. Uh, the dependency analysis is exactly the same. I actually didn't have to change that at all. Um, what you also want to do is you want to be able to tell the lock agent that, for example, the nodes, if you want to claim a lock, lock on a number of nodes, you can add the information that you want the lock to be uh, granted on every node or on just a minority of the nodes, a uh, majority of the nodes, or the majority, a majority of the nodes that are alive, for example. Those are the options that I support right now. And this could actually mean that if you've required all, a lock on all, all nodes and some of those nodes go away, uh, there is an option that you can either wait for them to reappear or simply abort because now you cannot claim all the locks that you asked for. So read-write locks, that was another uh, challenge. So, <clears throat> but it also doesn't actually affect the dependency analysis except for little, the check of who waits for whom. 
but that's actually in the lock server. Uh, so you have the queue. So what I have actually is a read lock is an entry in the queue where it's a read flag and then all the agents or clients that are holding that lock. So once this list is empty, you can serve the next lock, which could be a write lock, and so on. So that actually also didn't uh, modify the uh, dependency. <coughs> but then the really tricky part was the hierarchical, hierarchical locks, where the idea here is that the lock ID is a list, list of identifiers. So in this case, it could be the, the database, uh, a database instance, a table in the database, and an object, or whatever. This is just an example. The thing here was to introduce implicit locks, where if I've locked the resource A, B, for example, um, this would mean, or and then I lock A, B, C, 1, then the lock server would uh, notice that there is an implicit lock on AB, which is uh, a parent of ABC1. So there is an implicit write lock from client one. So then client two here is put in the queue. And it will actually create parent lock entries uh, when needed. So for example, I can have, uh, I could lock ABC1, ABC2, it would create those lock entries. But then if um, someone is trying to lock AB after that, then first you find the child entries and you enter implicit lock entries in the queue and then you insert the, uh, uh, the new client in the queue. Was that understandable? And um, so the only thing is that uh, the lock server needs to keep track of these implicit locks and remove them too once, uh, uh, once the agent terminates. But again, this didn't change the dependency analysis because it doesn't care if a lock is implicit or explicit. So. I did some optimizations. I actually haven't pushed these changes, but uh, since uh, Klarna found a little scalability bug in the Benizia lock server, where if you had thousands of locks in the same transaction, it would actually be like 100 times slower. I tested my code and found that it was even worse. Um, <clears throat> I, following Joe Armstrong's advice to make the code as inefficient as possible, this was actually as inefficient as possible. Uh, after some um, optimizations, I did run some, this is actually basically uh, claiming a thousand locks in the same, uh, uh, in the same transaction, and then 1,001, 1,002, up to 1,010 and then running 10 iterations and uh, averaging the uh, time it took per lock request. So you can see that it's not exactly blazingly fast, but it doesn't get slower as you go to 3,000 locks, 5,000 locks. This is latency, so it's actually uh, run time in microseconds. So, <clears throat> If you uh, use the synchronous begin transaction function, it takes about 100 seconds to create a transaction context and uh, possibly adding some locks, lock requests in the, uh, in the start and waiting for those. I found that that was uh, uh, not what I wanted most of the time, so I added an asynchronous spawn agent, which takes about 20 microseconds plus some 50 microseconds of setup in the agent, and then you can go on claiming locks from there. So I think in, um, you know, obviously it would not be a drop-in replacement for the Mnesia locker because the cheapest uh, cases in Mnesia are much cheaper than this. Um, it's possible that you could optimize it even more. Um, so the leader election, uh, 
the idea there was that since I have the multi-node <coughs> locks and I have a deadlock resolution um, algorithm, basically if you have several processes trying to claim the same locks on, on a bunch of nodes, you're almost guaranteed to have a deadlock. But since the algorithm detects and resolves that, it will eventually pick one transaction that holds all the locks. So the, the locks leader behavior will just, the way it works is that you, when you start it, you name, you give it a lock name, and it will try to claim that lock on all the nodes it sees. Or, and um, it will do so asynchronously. So this process will get, um, it will get lock info updates from its lock agent including a message saying, now you have all locks. So then it will know that it is the leader because it got all the locks that it claimed. And after that, it works pretty much like gen leader. Now, if you have workers, let's see, I actually have a slide for that. It's the same picture. Um, the thing about the, um, the lock info messages in the asynchronous mode, the, um, you get discovery, you get a lock info message, and it has all the other candidates in the queue. So then you're actually informed of new candidates. So one of the problems with GenLeader was that it didn't do well with nodes that would come and go. But this will actually just auto-detect new nodes and add them to, um, to the list of candidates. Now, another thing that you have in gen leader is workers. Workers are not candidates for leaders, but they actually, they want to be part of the group. So in this case, obviously, they, you don't want them to attempt to lock the resource. So what they do is they go to the lock server and subscribe to lock info messages. And... Um, so the lock server will inform all, all involved agents and all processes that actually subscribe to state changes in that lock. So then they will be informed <coughs> with all, of all the candidates and they will then contact those candidates. So then the candidates are informed of, of all the workers. So, <coughs> the... Um, Question is, is this a better gen leader uh, than gen leader? I don't know. It does handle dynamic networks in a much cleaner way than gen leader did. Essentially, with gen leader, there have been a few hacks to add dy dynamic node discovery in, uh, in gen leader. But it's, it's a bit awkward. And also, you have to change the underlying algorithm to be able to, uh, uh, to fix that. Another thing about this is that you can actually have multiple leader candidates. You can have a whole uh, leader election structure on the same Erlang node because it only cares about the name of the lock. For one thing, that's really good for testing because you don't have to fire up a bunch of slave nodes in order to test the, uh, the algorithm. Uh, you don't have to register candidates, so you can, you can fire up anonymous uh, leader election structures. One of the examples I have is, uh, is a global dictionary where you just uh, start processes that are, you name the dictionary essentially by giving it a lock name, and then you can have multiple processes and they will just replicate the dictionary. One thing that I added, this is actually the same dictionary that was in GenLeader as an example, but I added um, healing from net splits and merging, dictionary merging, just to verify that it, that actually works. So I did uh, add net split handling and conflict resolution. Um, a few more uh, functions, for example, ask candidates. So the, when the leader is elected, it can actually go out and talk to the other candidates. Um, and, for example, fetch data and do uh, data merging 
So, as far as uh, actually being used, I have seen that some people are using the uh, LOX leader behavior. Um, some people have actually uh, identified some issues, but I can't say that there is um, a tremendous amount of traffic yet on the uh, repository. What I'm doing is I'm integrating this into the um, KBDB DBMS, which I presented um, a while back at, uh, it was uh, not the, the last Erlang factory, but one before that um, in San Francisco. So I, I have a branch of that database system that I'm running uh, the, uh, our device management test suites on. It's a fairly complex uh, application and um, all the test suites are passing, which is nice. Um, and I also have a branch of GProc using the LOX leader um, uh, application. And uh, so if you want to use GProc with dynamic node discovery, I would recommend this instead of uh, the gen leader branch. And it would be great to have people actually try this and find bugs. Of course, there aren't any. Uh, I never have any bugs in my code, except the ones that John Hughes keeps finding and uh, giving presentations about. <laughs> I'm his guinea pig for quick check. Um, and uh, the unit test, I, I don't use quick check to test this, actually, um, or haven't. I have a little uh, script evaluator where I can Re at a reasonably high level, uh, describe different scenarios and what I expect from each lock operation. So the unit test actually does test some reasonably weird uh, deadlock situations and lock upgrades and hierarchical locks and things like that. And I'm also working on a, a locks leader unit test, but I'm not quite finished with that yet. So. There is the, um, the address. Um, and well, do you have any questions? He doesn't bite. Everything is clear. Costas isn't here. So uh, apologies if I, if I missed this in the talk, but what is the protocol in the case of a genuine net split and in the case of high latency, which might be misinterpreted as a, as a net split? So the, um, uh, the lock agents don't really um, understand net split per se. And uh, remember <coughs> that all uh, lock or lock ID and node instances are uh, one single lock or one single lock instance. So if you get, they will actually monitor other nodes or the lock servers on other nodes. So obviously what happens is that those locks will, will disappear. Now if you, um, so when you, once you recover, there is actually a little, once you get a node up from another node that you're monitoring, if you have the option that you want to follow other nodes and wait for them to come back, what you do when you get a node up is you send a little, um, actually a, a, a script, an Erlang with abstract format script, and you do a, a Erl eval evaluation that actually sets a little uh, registers a little process so that as soon as the lock server comes up, it will try to notify all waiting uh, lock agents using that little script. And, um, and then you may actually have a deadlock. Um, or at least that could be the case if you have uh, instances that, um, that are claiming the same lock. So in the lock leader, uh, actually, the lock leader behavior is the one that detects that there could be a leader conflict. Uh, 
the, the leader algorithm or the lock, locking algorithm will just treat this as any de deadlock and it will resolve it and it will pick one instance that has all those locks. Um, so the, um, uh, what, what remains for the lock leader uh, code is to note that it actually was the leader. So if it gets informed that there is another leader, some, somebody else's leader, and I, my leader flag was set, then this has actually happened. There was a disconnect, and now um, there has to be a resolution. So, and, and so the, uh, it does the healing automatically. The trick in the, in the leader election behavior is that you have to, under, you have to know that it happened. No. Longer than the, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if it does, it's a bug. Um, and it, I mean, it's a reactive design, so uh, the, uh, you don't wait for or time out and, the, and start wondering if there is a deadlock. You actually find out pretty much as soon as you get the information, and then you act on it. So it's, it's pretty uh, swift in, uh, in detecting and resolving deadlocks. So the, um, and um, so one of the things we wanted to uh, achieve was to make it at least as close to minimal as possible so that you have a minimum of messages flying back and forth in a distributed case. And um, <coughs> I have a question because I know yes. Uv doesn't bite until it's dark, so mm -hmm. it's free to ask now. And if uh, you, after being bought a few beers. So. Okay, okay, yeah. So. Or I bite before that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure you get a beer. Uh, anyway, did you get the patent? Um, um, <laughs> it was interesting. We, um, we actually got uh, the worst, uh, dumbest uh, patent engineer, um, or I hope so. I tried him, so no. Um, and, and essentially we learned that, uh, that even though Ericsson actually did pay some money for being, you know, getting to the point where you actually officially apply for the patent, it's not worth it. Um, just the stupidity and the, the horribleness of the process, it's not worth the money. Um, we got to the point that after about a year, uh, we got a really stupid uh, response back with a bunch of text uh, um, patents that supposedly uh, already solved this, which they didn't. So we sent a long reply back saying this is nothing like our algorithm. And actually the way the patent process works is that you have to, um, if you're actually different in just one claim, it is not the same patent. And, uh, and the, basically the one claim that they had was that it was also a deadlock detection algorithm. But that's not enough to, um, to um, say that you have a blocking patent. But essentially, since Ericsson wasn't using the algorithm at the time, we agreed to drop the whole thing. And I did ask Ericsson afterwards if it was okay for them to, uh, for me to continue. And um, so the, the two algorithms I showed here were actually closer to uh, this algorithm than those patents were. So I wouldn't worry about them. So it was just a, a long, very painful process for us. And we decided it was worth the time because it actually does cost money to, to fight the patent engineers. Uh, it wasn't worth it since we actually weren't using the algorithm at the time. Um, and I would say what this does is a, is a very fairly small modification of that algorithm from 83 that I showed. Right? It's, it's essentially just that you don't, you don't send uh, quite as many messages. So, um, I had approval from Ericsson to release it as open source, and I would say that there's plenty of prior art. 
I have looked at a lot of patents and I, there is no patented algorithm that, uh, that does this. And I don't think you can patent it actually because there is so much prior art. Uh, so. I know the, the, the pain you've been through. I, I used to work for a big teleco company too and yeah, and one of the requirements for getting promoted was that you had to file for patents and get them. Yeah. <laughs> and actually the idea was to get the patent and just release it as open source. Yeah. So, yeah. so it is now released as open source. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, an Apache, no it's not an Apache, it's uh, the MPL2 license. And, and don't worry about uh, the patent issue. It's not patented, and uh, it's not in violation either. Any other questions? Or were there only two brave men in the room, or women? Okay, going once, twice, locked. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, both, both on the way out. <laughs>